So my name's Mark. I'm a, I'm a storyteller. And I'm going to tell you why stories are going to save the world. And I'm going to do this to begin with through the medium of story. And this story, like all stories, begins with silence. It happened here with a touching of the ankles and a swelling of the belly. A baby was born. And it was beautiful and healthy in every single way and normal in every single way but one. Instead of a belly button, it had a little silver cross like the top of a screw. And he was fine. His mom still loved him the same. But when he was getting changed for PE, you know, he, he faced the wall so no one saw his little silver belly button. And when he went swimming, he wore one of those long blue and white striped swimming costumes from his shoulders to just above the knees, you know? Because then were the times. And because then were the times, when he met a girl, he looked at her, she looked away. She looked at him, he looked away. Maybe some of you know what love is like. When they were going to get married, they never saw each other naked until the wedding night. All prim and proper, Presbyterian values. And it gets to the day before the wedding, and this boy is so nervous. So he goes to his mama, like all sensible, nervous boys. He says, Mama, I'm so afraid that she's going to see my little silver belly button and think I'm a freak. She's going to leave me on the night of our wedding. His mama looks at him with the crinkled wisdom of age. She says, my darling boy, you've got to talk to the woman you're going to marry. You've got to communicate with your partner for the rest of your life. Or else, or else what do you have? And if she sweats this small stuff, she was never right for you anyway. It's nice, right? And he knows deep down that this is the right advice. But he also has got this deep-seated fear. And he says, Mama, I recognize that that's the right thing to do, but is there anything else I can do to avoid this confrontation? She says, well, you know my advice, but if you won't take it, you could always go down to the woods, see what the she will do for you. The she, as I'm sure you know, are the Gallic fairies. And these people aren't Tinkerbell. They live in a world just parallel to ours, millimeters beneath. And their advice sometimes goes awry because they don't know what it's like to be a human being. So, but he decides he's going to risk it. And he goes down to the woods, finds a nice clearing, strips naked. So it's a good bet when you're dealing with the she. He lies down in that clearing, pretends to be asleep. As the sun sets and the moon rises, he peeks through his eye. And he sees, beating down upon him, is a beautiful silver moonbeam. And as he watches, down that moonbeam floats a beautiful Elegant, slender, silver, svelte, and sibilant chi, holding a beautiful, long, elegant, slender, silver, svelte, and sibilant Phillips screwdriver. And she kneels on the heath beside him and slots that into his belly button and twists. And out from his belly comes a beautiful, long, elegant, slender, silver, cross headed screw. And with the screw in one hand and the screwdriver in the other hand, the she drifts back off up that moonbeam. When she's gone, at least with his feet, I'm normally says, I'm healed. And then his bum falls off. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. There's no time. Stop. 20 years ago, John McInnes spoke at this university, and he said, the fairy world is a metaphor for the imagination. And in this story, despite it being clearly modern, in fact, it was written by Patrick Rothfuss, I'm led to believe. Um, it, it involves a hero stepping out into the world, facing or shouldering the burden of an inadequacy, encountering the other in a natural liminal space, struggling and returning having changed. And this is true of most stories in the Celtic cycle. People meet the other in a natural space where the two worlds meet and return having been humbled. I'd like to know if you've ever stepped out into nature and felt the awe of it around you, the tremendous other. You felt very small, but connected to the deep lineage of the place that you're standing. This is our friend Kat Mallows in a farm in Spain. And this is John Muir, who famously walked through the Yosemite Valley and compared it to a cathedral. He says, these mountains are God's words writ large. He felt connected to a wider creation. And you can see in his face, he's having an experience. Uh, this is me having <laughs> an experience in a, in a liminal rhododendron bush. Uh, this is the Berkrick Stone Circle, which is near where I grew up. These stones have been there for thousands of years. And if you look, there's a second circle of stones around the ones that still survive. Uh, and this is a very heavy place. When you stand there, you can feel the two worlds meeting. The Conison Fells look like a pregnant woman lying on her back. Uh, and they suppose this is why they built the stones there. And when you come here, 
it's very hard to feel like you're king of the world. The landscape is wild, and there's this sense of the other. And curiously enough, because of this sense of the other, this has become a site of preservation. People don't build there. And imagining the fairies, that realm of imagination, has led to an actual conservation through laissez-faire uh, conservation ethics. So these are the characteristics of the Celtic myth. Uh, as, as you can see, our story with the, with the bomb screw, despite being modern, fits every one of them. I'd like to draw your attention in particular to the numinous, uh, which is what in, is encountered in the liminal space. C.S. Lewis, who popularized this term, describes the numinous like this. He says, if one believed there was a mighty spirit in the next room, the disturbance would be profound. One would feel wonder and a certain shrinking, a sense of inadequacy to cope with such a visitant. This feeling may be described as awe, and the object which excites it is the numinous. So numinous is a transformative power we encounter in natural spaces in Celtic mythology. Again, the numinous is a transformative power which is encountered in natural spaces in every story in the Celtic mythology. But you may be asking why this is important. Why is it important that we have this sense of ourselves that's generated by exposure to the natural world? Uh, I argue that it's very important because our place in the world determines how we understand the world or how we view ourselves in the planet will affect how we contextualize ourselves in the planet. This is uh, somewhat ruined by Izzy's fantastic talk um, because it is, of course, a tweet by Donald Trump, uh, which would be, could you move the slide on? Hard to believe um, if we hadn't just, just analyzed it. So this is obviously a certain narrative about the environment. Um, obviously, he's denying the environment on the, on the highest level, but he's also making other narratives about it. The first is that the climate is a comparable or a laterally coherent uh, priority with US production. It's an economic um, object, but not a moral necessity. So even by denying climate change, he's making all these other narratives and assumptions about the climate and putting it into a conceptual scheme where it's not that valuable. Thanks. Uh, this is what seems to be an opposite view. This is a solution to solve climate change by a man named David Keith. He wants to use uh, jets and rockets to put sulfuric acid into the atmosphere. And this is his plan to cheaply and easily stop global warming. Uh, and while he's well-intentioned, I'd argue that he has the same destructive narratives uh, that the, the current president has. He views humanity as floating above a mechanistic world, which can be controlled and manipulated in a way which suits the human interest without regard for other, other beings or other life. Fortunately, he was never allowed to do this um, yet. Uh, and I think that that might be something to be grateful for because while this would solve one human problem, it is another form of pollutant with uncertain consequences. Uh, and I think that both these people, Trump and Keith, are going naked into the woods, and they're waiting to see what their reaction will be from nature. And I wish I could take them both and make them feel the numinous, either through story or from taking them up to Berkeley Common. Because when you contextualize yourself in that way, when you imagine yourself going into the woods and meeting the great other, or when you listen to the story of Jemima Puddle Duck and imagine yourself as a duck with duck friends and duck things to do, it becomes very hard to hold on to that image of humans as the be-all and end-all of experience. And when you decentralize yourself from the human story and look at yourself as part of a rich family of life, you're doing deep ecology before you even know that you're doing it. And we can trick people almost or guide people into bringing things that were otherwise distant very close to the power of story. Uh, this chart, I think, shows how we normally understand um, reality as objective facts, which then filter out and become myths and legends. Uh, but if you move to the next slide, actually, uh, I think that there's a lot more of the other way around. So if any of you have studied philosophy of science here at the university, Lakatosh and Kuhn, a few nods, um, you might know that our observations about the world are laden with our theories about the world. Uh, and what we choose to look for scientifically is not arrived at scientifically, that's a product of our culture and a product of other forces and pressures. So what we believe in the collective unconscious, for instance, if we believe that we need a mechanistic solution to climate change, or if we believe X, Y, Z, these will lead us to certain conclusions uh, that wouldn't be possible if we had a different vision of our place in the world. 
And I think storytellers have a very unique position with one step in the collective consciousness as held by the mythopoetic with all its environmental information and one step in forming people's conceptions of themselves in the world and realities. And it can be done anywhere. It doesn't need any equipment. It can be done for free. I think it's a very good tool. Uh, and if you doubt me, take a look at these fine men. Uh, on the right is John Muir. You may recognize him from earlier. He was born pretty close to here uh, in Dunbar, moved to America. And he's broadly credited with inventing the modern national park project. Uh, but he wasn't a politician. His own political career failed. His attempts to lobby broadly failed. Uh, instead, he was famous at the time for his nature writing, uh, mostly fictional or quasi-biographical talks about his travels in nature and his poems. Uh, and on the left is Theodore Roosevelt, who in his life did create five national parks, 18 national monuments, and 53 wildlife reserves, and quoted Muir's language all the time. In Roosevelt's obituary of John Muir, which he wrote after John Muir's death, he says, no man was more able to influence contemporary thought and action than John Muir. To say that again, the most powerful man on the planet said that no man was more able to influence contemporary thought and action than this poet and storyteller. Thanks. To conclude, I say that storytelling has a unique capacity to bring what is otherwise distant into our realm of understanding through metaphor and through fable. When we imagine ourselves as other creatures and decentralize ourselves from the human experience, we are able to empathize with that which is otherwise refined out of our sphere of understanding through uh, reductive language. And I think that if everybody listened to one Celtic myth a day or went into nature to experience a numinous one today, we'd be living in a very different planet. Thank you very much.